Hi, this is Liz with the Bozeman Public Library. Welcome to this talk on Frank Little, a story about the real person from the cold millions. Frank Little was a union organizer and agitator who was murdered in Butte in 1917. His case remains unsolved. Parts of the presentation will talk about the details of his death and depict cartoons regarding his treatment. Viewer discretion is advised. Frank Little was born in 1879 to Quaker parents in Oklahoma. He joined the International Workers of the World Union in 1905 after working as a miner in Bisbee, Arizona for several years. Members of this union were also known as Wadleys. His brother Fred Little and sister-in-law Emma Little were also union organizers. Little was an organizer from the start. He was known as the hobo agitator, organizing and preaching to laborers of every background, race, and ethnicity, and for being able to mobilize transient migrant workers to a cause. He worked with laborers from a variety of trades, including lumberjacks, migrant farm workers, miners, and oil field workers. He participated in free speech campaigns, including the one in Spokane from the novel in The Cold Millions, and the one in Missoula with Elizabeth Gurley Clem. For more information regarding that campaign, please watch the previous episode in this series. As Elizabeth Gurley Flynn said after his death, he was part Indian and spoke of himself as a real American and a real Red. The rest of you are immigrants. He was dependable in all situations. Frank Little was arrested several times over the course of his work. In 1909, he was arrested for reading the Declaration of Independence in Spokane and was sentenced to 30 days at the Franklin School. He successfully organized fruit workers in California and took part in many more free speech battles in California, Missouri, and Illinois. He organized multiple strikes throughout the Midwest, working with all sorts of laborers. He served as an outspoken member of the, of the executive board of the IWW in 1917. In August 1913, four years before his death, Little supported and helped organize the Ordock worker strike after a fatal accident killed two workers. 500 workers protested the safety conditions of work in Duluth against the Great Northern Railroad Company. The Wobblies and strikers demanded better pay and safety conditions. The main newspapers in the area agreed with company leaders and blamed the strike on organizers such as Frank Little. Another organizer, Leo Lockie, was attacked when he tried to speak, and Frank Little was kidnapped by railroad detectives, taken to a farmhouse in Carleton County, and held under armed guards. Wobblies and their supporters rescued him, and his return to Duluth was celebrated by the strikers and labor supporters. After the kidnapping attempt, the president of one of the companies fired all the dock workers, while Great Northern gave the workers one last chance to come back to work with a small pay raise, which ended the strike in an unhappy compromise. Frank Little was an anti-capitalist and staunchly opposed to World War I. Little believed that the war was just a play for the rich to build their wealth while poor men went to fight. Even though others of the Union leadership agreed, protesting the government's position on the war could destroy the Union through government repression. The Union couldn't help to sway perception of the war or hope to stop it until all laborers were unionized. For this reason, the IWW focused on Union organizing rather than opposing the military draft and war efforts. Little, however, disagreed with the leadership of the Union and was an outspoken critic of the war and those who participated in it. In the years before the U.S. entered World War I, rampant patriotism and xenophobic propaganda allowed corporate leaders to crack down on strikes and Union organizing. In June of 1917, the U.S. government passed the Espionage Act. The act was used to curb free speech, but was originally stated to prevent interference with military operations or recruitment in subordination in the military and providing support for U.S. enemies during wartime. In 1919, the Supreme Court ruled that the law didn't violate the free speech of those who were convicted under it, which included many IWW members. Frank Little is considered a hero by the IWW and was a martyr that many mourned. To others, he and the IWW were considered traitors. While I've mentioned several times that this era of American history, patriotism was a driving force that influenced how laborers, especially immigrant laborers, were treated. The situation in Montana needs a special note. Montana was, for the most part, supported America's entry into World War I. 40,000 men enlisted or were drafted, and that was 10% of the state's population at the time. Other industries in Montana exceeded their production goals or contributed to the war effort, such as farmers planting bumper crops and the copper industry working continuous shifts 
anti-German sentiment meant that anybody of German descent who were not a vocal advocate for the war could have been treated with suspicion or investigated by committees such as the Third Degree Committee in Billings. Some examples of anti-German behavior include a German Mennonite minister merely getting lynched and a German language books being burned from the Fergus County High School. This period also had its own version of freedom fries. Sauerkraut was called Liberty Cabbage and Hamburger Liberty Steak. The Montana Sedition Act in February of 1918 effectively put free speech rights on hold in the state. This is the environment that the organizers were fighting when they tried to create change with the strike of 1917. The Helena Independent published a very strongly worded editorial on August 2nd about Little's death with the following statement. The Independent cannot comprehend why the United States government has not long ago established prison camps and interned their enemies of the American government. It is beyond comprehension of the average citizen why the War Department has not ordered certain leaders arrested and shot. The people will not stand for much more. The policy of watchful waiting and dealing with the IWW will not be tolerated. The Bisbee deportations began on July 12, 1917. The striking labor groups in Bisbee were being illegally arrested and deported. The group doing the arrest were deputized by the Cochise County Sheriff, Harry C. Wheeler, who was following the orders of the mining company, Phelps Dodge. The Wobblies, strikers, and sympathizers were deported via train on cow cars without food and very little water for an 18-hour train ride through the Arizona summer heat to New Mexico. They were dropped off with nothing but the clothes on their backs, no money, no jobs, and no way home. The U.S. government eventually got in on the action and sent soldiers to assist with the deportations. Frank Little was not part of these deportations. He was recovering from a car accident, but he spoke out about the actions of the government, going so far as to call the soldiers participating in the deportations scabs. This term is an insult, meaning one who crosses the picket line in a strike. It is highly derogatory. Many were not happy with Little's insults of soldiers while the U.S. was at war, and some headlines even blamed his murder on this insult. On June 8, 1917, a fire was, spar- was started at the Speculator Mine in Butte. The fire was started when a cable was ignited by a carbide lamp carried by a miner. This accident resulted in the deaths of 168 miners and sparked a strike that would draw Frank Little to his doom. Men were found trapped behind bulkheads and in tunnels as many as 50 hours after the fire started. The mine was operated by the Anaconda Mine Copper Mining Company, known as the Company. Back then, the company contained huge amounts of economic and political power in the region. The company controlled the state and it controlled the press. The subsequent strike had huge ramifications for Montana, labor unions, and U.S. law. The strike began on June 11th. It was unorganized and very nearly spontaneous. The Commissioner of Labor and Industry, W.J. Swiddlehurst, blamed the strike on the disaster, the higher cost of living, and the wrestling car system which prevented migrant and transient laborers from finding mining positions in the company. The Commissioner also suggested that the IWW organizers and German propaganda also played a role in the strike. On June 12, the company condemned the strike and blamed Wobblies for stirring up seditious behavior among miners, and the company refused to negotiate or recognize the strike as legitimate. Over the next few days, additional labor groups, including the Metal Mine Workers Union and the Electricians Union, declared strikes as well, all demanding increased wages and better working conditions. By the end of June, an estimated 15,000 men were not working. The company tried to control the narrative and specifically targeted the IWW as German-friendly socialists and traders. When the strike started, the Butte Daily Post claimed that the wages, living conditions, and safety record of the Montana mines were better or average for similar mining camps. The day after the accident, Butte Daily Post claimed that the company's safety record was gratifying. The newspapers published editorials and responses to the strike predicting violence and talking about the union organizers being German sympathizers employed to disrupt manufacturing and industry production during wartime. The Butte Miner even suggested that strike leaders should be incarcerated and forced to work for food. They encouraged the government to respond harshly to union members and strike organizers. The Butte Bulletin, a union-friendly paper, also had their say. They claimed the companies were hiring mercenary gunmen to intimidate strikers and claimed the mine owners were the unpatriotic ones. 
The district attorney at the time, Burton Wheeler, found no reports of alleged IWW violence or espionage in Montana, despite investigating, and he considered the strike caused by the safety conditions and fire in the mine. He concluded that the press falsely accused the IWW and made up stories about their activities in Montana. This was the environment for Frank Little when he arrived in Butte on July 18th. He was no stranger to controversy or violence. The Espionage Act, anti-immigrant sentiment, media perpetuated fears of conspiracy and sabotage of the mine by foreign agents, and an angry workforce numbering in the thousands striking in an industry that was directly linked to the war efforts made for very volatile conditions for everyone involved. In his last conversation with Bill Haywood, the president of the IWW, Little famously said, don't worry, fellow worker, all we're going to need from now on is guts. Little arrived in Butte using crutches to support his plaster cast and broken leg and suffering from a hernia. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn described him as tall and dark with black hair and black eyes, a slender, gentle, and soft-spoken man. He was killed less than two weeks after arriving in Butte. For the two weeks Little was in Butte, he gave a number of speeches to rally the strikers. He was already known for his antagonistic insults towards the military and the government about the war. On June 28, 1917, the Butte Daily Post posted an article documenting some of his speeches and what Little was saying. I was unable to find full text of his speeches and only quotes that may or may not be in context. The Butte Daily Post called the language seditious. Frank Little referred to the Constitution of the United States as a scrap of paper that could be torn up and discarded at any time. He also called the mayor a puppet of capitalists. The article also states from the previous week, Little threatened to keep the soldiers so busy at home that they wouldn't be sent to France to fight in the war. Before dawn on August 1st, 1917, six masked men broke into the boarding house Frank Little was lodged at. They woke up the landlady, Nora Byrne, identified themselves as officers, and asked which room Little was staying in. She directed them to room 32. They broke into his room, gagged him, and dragged him out, leaving behind his clothes and crutches. Little was tossed into the back of a car and driven a short distance away before they stopped, tied him to the bumper, and dragged him out of town. He was tied to the trestle of a railroad bridge and tossed over the edge. His body was found the next morning, a note pinned to his thigh. No arrests were made, and his murders remain unknown to today. Nora Byrne waited a half hour before calling the police on the advice of other boarders who were woken up by the commotion. The police arrived and told her that Little had been deported, but they would try and track the vehicle. The note pinned to his underwear read, Others take notice. First and last warning, 3777. The letters on the bottom are possibly initials of other IWW members who received threats in the days after Little's death. 3777 could have several meanings. One theory is that it represents Montana's regulations for grave sites, three feet wide, seven feet deep, and 77 inches long. Jane Little Bodkin, Little's grandniece and author of The Frank Little and the IWW, The Blood That Stained an American Family, suggests that the numbers are a warning to vagrants to leave. A $3 train ticket on the 7 a.m. stagecoach ordered by a secret committee of 77 men from Helena. Another theory about the numbers is that they refer back to Pioneer Day vigilantes who would use the letters as a warning to someone to leave within 24 hours or face vigilante justice. It was also used to call a meeting of the vigilantes together. Dashiell Hammett, a fictional author, told his companion at the time that he was offered $5,000 to murder Little, but never went through with it. Some believe he did do it, but one of his biographers suggests that he didn't, and being asked made him feel guilty enough that someone thought he was the kind of man who could. Hammett later became a communist and ended up on a blacklist some years later. Rumors about Little's murders also abound. Accusations have been leveled at law enforcement, other, rival, other union rivals, employees of the mining companies, and others affected by the strike, or just a mob of patriots angered by Little's contempt for the military. Little Botkin and several other historians think that most likely killers were employees of the Anaconda Mining Company, which is one of the reasons why the investigation didn't lead to any results. Thousands attended Little's funeral, and his death sparked protests across the West. However, his murder also sparked a government crackdown. Federal troops were sent to Butte, and martial law was declared in Spokane. Little's death and the mining strike of 1917 were key instigators in the creation of the Federal Sedition Act of 1918, 
and 165 IWW members were arrested, many serving terms between 5 and 20 years due to this act. Little Bodkin claimed that even having a photo of Frank Little on you could be considered an act of sedition. The IWW lost prominence and power after these arrests, but they are still a functioning union and a labor rights organization today. On August 1st, Frank Little was killed. On August 10th, federal troops were patrolling Butte. Soldiers were sent to Butte to secure the mines in a war effort, and they remained in Butte until 1921. The strike officially ended in Butte, and it was considered a failure. Prominent figures in Montana faced reprisals for the positions on the IWW in the strike. Wheeler faced an inquisition, and he subsequently resigned as district attorney. He would later run as senator in the 1920s and served as Montana senator from 1923 until 1947. In 1918, Judge Charles Liebert Crom of Rosebud and Musselshell counties was impeached due to high crimes and misdemeanors and malfeasance in office. He was of German descent and was opposed to the war and freed IWW members from the county jail. The impeachment was later rescinded by the Montana Senate in 1991, long after his death. Jeanette Rankin, who supported the miners, going so far as to denounce the Anaconda Mining Company on the House floor, lost her seat in the House of Representatives in the 1918 election. Rankin also voted against the U.S. entering the war in 1917, which also contributed to her low popularity. She also urged a probe into the murder of Frank Linnell. The Helena Independent ran a scathing editorial on her, calling her a dupe of the Kaiser. She also wrote legislation that would give control of the mines to the U.S. government, but it didn't pass. She returned to Congress in 1941 and again was called to vote on the U.S. entries into World War II, and this time she was the only dissenting voice saying no to enter the war. Frank Little continues to inspire labor activists, and his work with unions and strikes and his death helped shape the 20th century and, in particular, Montana. Mourners wrote songs and poetry in his honor after his death. Only a few were shown in this presentation. You can read more about his work in Spokane and The Cold Millions by Jess Walter, this year's One Book, One Bozeman Choice. The book is available from the library or from one of our partners. You can check back for, to the library for more programs celebrating the people and the themes of this novel throughout the year, including an upcoming presentation on the, at the library focusing on unions in Montana coming up in May. Thank you for coming, and I hope you learned something with this presentation.